Hello, everyone. Welcome back to AAS Publishing. We're going to start a new playlist series where we're going to be talking uh, with authors of AAS journal publications. And today I have with me Zach Meisel. Hi, Frank. Uh, thanks for having me. It's uh, fun to be the, the guinea pig here for this discussion yeah. series. You get to be the first one. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Goes. So what we're going to do is uh, we're going to talk about one of uh, Zach's recent publications and the uh, intent here is that the content is to be for uh, research active uh, people. So this has a little different bent than uh, AAS Nova. So we will be talking um, astronomy, hardball at times, um, and that's okay given, given the target audience. So I'm going to do a screen share, uh, and you can see which paper we're going to talk about, and we'll just sort of chat about the paper as though Zach was, or I walked into Zach's office, and he was telling me some pretty cool results. So let me do a quick screen share here. Okay, and what we have up is spallation altered accreted compositions for X-ray bursts, uh, the impact on ignition conditions and burst ashes. So Zach, why don't you give me sort of a a uh, high level a little bit on what this yeah yeah so let me first quickly just start by giving a brief introduction about me because probably many people don't know who i am so my name is zach meisel i'm an assistant professor at ohio university in the physics and astronomy department and i'm the director of the edwards accelerator laboratory so it's a nuclear physics lab there my research group is a nuclear astrophysics group uh, much of we do is nuclear physics experiment but a lot of the work, uh, particularly my work, uh, is related to modeling uh, astrophysical scenarios and X-ray bursts is one of our foci. So this is one of the more recent projects to come out of the group in terms of modeling X-ray bursts. Cool. And so uh, what we did here is we were looking at how the ashes, well, yeah, how the ashes uh, are altered in X-ray bursts and just in general how the X-ray burst conditions are altered by spallation of the accreted material. So normally, when we model an X-ray burst, we assume we have some composition from our donor star. We accrete that onto the surface. That builds up for a while. There's some surface burning, and then the burst happens. Right. But back in the early 90s, Lars Bildston had an idea that, well, hey, wait a second. You have basically a beam <laughs> coming in. You have some surface material. You have some target, basically. And so if you have a high energy beam hitting the target, shouldn't that spall? And shouldn't you change the surface composition just from the spallation? Right, so what's the energy of, so when we say beam here, we're probably mean protons coming in from the accretion? Basically protons and, and, and probably alpha particles, right? Because you, you assume you mostly have uh, hydrogen and helium coming in. So that's your beam. And the energy is the gravitational energy, so 200 MeV per nucleon. Okay. So rather, high, rather high energies, but stuff we can produce in the lab. Mm -hmm. And um, so, that, so the, the idea then is your, your heavy nuclei, when they come in, they're going to slow down quicker. They're going to stop quicker in the surface of the neutron star because they have a higher charge. Whereas the protons are going to take, they're going to be able to go to a deeper depth. So basically your heavier nuclei kind of stall out and your protons, and maybe helium nuclei, blast through okay. and they can spall those heavier nuclei and change the composition. And those heavier nuclei that they're spalling are iron? Um, it's basically, we, we tend to assume a solar type metal composition. So okay. sure you have iron, but basically solar abundances. Mm -hmm. What Lars did back in his early nineties paper is he said, let's just focus on carbon, nitrogen, oxygen. Let's just look at the CNO metals. Um, because oftentimes for X-ray burst models, your metals are all just lumped in to that anyways. Okay. And, uh, what he looked at is, okay, how is the carbon, nitrogen, oxygen destroyed by the spallation? So it basically reduces it. Um, so then in comes this work. Despreet Rindawa, who's the first author, he, he came up with the idea for this work uh, after reading Lars's paper. And his thinking was, well, wait a second, you don't just have carbon, nitrogen, oxygen for your metals. You also have all these heavier nuclei, like for instance, iron. And these should undergo spallation as well. And in principle can replenish some of those CNO elements. Ah, I see. So that, was the, that was the idea was like, let's go ahead and do an actual nuclear reaction network. Let's take solar metals and see how they're changed by spallation. Okay. Gotcha. So I think if we go to figure two, I believe. Let's go to figure two and there we yeah, there go. It is. Yeah. 
So there you can see um, one example of how a spallation can alter your, your surface composition. So you're looking at the abundance versus atomic number for some lighter elements. Um, and the red cross is those that would be your sol solar abundance distribution, you know, for instance, from, from Gravas or from Lauders. Got it. Um, and then uh, the spalled abundance distribution are the blue circles that you see there. And the, the intensity, the light to dark, that's just a different accretion rate. Um, Got it. It's going to change your, uh, your abundance distribution. But basically what you see is that everything above boron um, is basically depleted by spallation and everything below boron and below is either enhanced or not significantly changed. So right. you don't really change the hydrogen and helium because those aren't, nothing really happens there, right. but uh, everything else you bust apart and convert that into lighter elements. Cool. Okay. Uh, yeah. yeah, I'm with you. And, uh, Okay, M dots and so, kilograms for it's a mass flux in kilograms. Okay, got it. Yeah, it's kind of a, um, not the usual astronomy solar masses per year kind of thing. Okay. It's not. Uh, I will. I'm going to throw Jaspreet under the bus here since I gave him credit for the idea too because he came up with it. I'll throw him under the bus. He he likes this mode of expressing it. Um, for context, let's say we take an 11 kilometer neutron star, okay. that 30 kilogram per centimeter squared per second. That's something approaching like a half an Eddington. Okay. So, so if you were at 10 kilograms per centimeter squared per second for an 11 kilometer for 11 kilometer radius neutron star, that's something like 0.1 Eddington. So your right. typical burst accretion rate. Okay. Thanks. And so then the 60, that's basically an Eddington. We're close to it. Uh, right. Thanks. Okay. Yep. Very good. Yep. Um, so then what you see here is that it, it does depend to some extent on the accretion rate, um, <clears throat> but that's not, a, a huge impact here for the overall abundance distribution. It's, it's hard to see any effect here. And the reason that it does depend on the accretion rate at all is you basically have these heavy elements. So, yep, you have a question? No, go ahead. Oh yeah, so you have heavy elements stopping uh, in the outer layers and then the protons going through, but meanwhile, these heavy elements are diffusing. They're trying to escape. <laughs> and so the, the higher your accretion rate is, the kind of more you're bombarding protons through, but also the more you're burying those heavier nuclei, and it's kind of this interchange. Of those right. two Competition. It's going to be accretion rate dependent. And conveniently, we have figure one there. So you see the exposure time versus that accretion rate. Mm -hmm. And the exposure time says, how long is my poor heavy element sitting there just getting bombarded? <laughs> and the higher your accretion rate, the less time it's getting bombarded. So there's fewer chances for spallation. Right. Right. Uh, what's a typical range of accretion rates for nominal X-ray bursts? So yeah, so for a, uh, a burster, I'd, I'd say the, the mixed hydrogen helium burning, you're talking about a, a tenth of an Eddington, maybe a little bit less than that, um, up to something like 0.3 Eddington, maybe. I mean, you can, you can, it depends whether you're talking about observed or model calculations now, but let's say anywhere from a tenth all the way up to almost an Eddington, you can get some kind of bursting going on. Um, as you go to lower accretion rates, lower than 10th of an Eddington, you, then you get um, things like pure helium burning because all your hydrogen's gone. Right. Uh, all kinds of crazy things can happen. If anyone's curious, uh, Lawrence Cake and Alex Hager have a, a handful of papers on this at, at different accretion rates, what kind of burning regimes are you in? It's sort of a more recent survey. Yes, they do. I think I've seen one or two of those. But here, the conditions that we're using are very similar to what in model calculations reproduces, say, the clock burster. So GS1826 minus 24. These are those are the kinds of conditions well, that, that we're looking Very good. <laughs> 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 okay, so what do you get? Uh, so you put this in a, a in a reaction network, you uh, include all the production and destruction terms. Right, right. So yeah, so we can keep going down on the paper maybe a little bit. So we basically you can see here there's a a single zone reaction network where the, all the spallation is done. And that is just uh, where you can figure out how the surface composition has changed. So that's for instance, how figure, figure two is created. And then in the rest of the paper, we kind of explore the implications for this. And this is uh, Brad Meyer's NukeNet? Yeah, yeah, there's actually a patchwork of codes here. It's kind of fun. These are all open source codes that were used for this, which I really like. Um, so the, uh, 
So this, the actual spallation reaction network, that was uh, Brad Myers' LibNucNet. And then we looked at how the ignition conditions would change based on your altered uh, metal, metallicity. Uh, and that was the code settle from uh, Andrew Cumming, right. which I believe goes back to his Lars Bildson days because he came out of that group. And then we ultimately also explore the effect on the burst ashes. And that was with Mesa, which I think you are familiar with. And for any of your listeners who are not, you need to look it up. It's a great I have no idea. So the yellow in figure three is uh, stable nuclei? Yeah, those are stable nuclei. And then the arrows are essentially indicating the flux. Mm -hmm. So for that particular calculation, you can see that um, you, you already start out with a lot of CNO elements. Right. And so that's why you have a big arrow coming from 016 because there's just going to be a lot of um, reaction network flow there. And you see, for instance, that things from neon through oxygen and down, those actually wind up replenishing the carbon. Mm -hmm. So that's where we're going a bit beyond what, what uh, Bilston's initial, initial sort of nugget of an idea. Cool. Uh, so yeah, so the first thing to look at for the results is the impact on the ignition conditions. Um, so which figure are we looking at here? Uh, well, we can look at, for instance, figures four and five. So conveniently, they're both they're both there, which is great. Um, so one big difference in figure four is we can compare the Bildston result to the current work. So what happens when you have these heavier elements that are replenishing the carbon, as opposed to just starting out with CNO and destroying it? And so the red uh, in figure four, the red circles, this would be kind of the Bildston type result where your carbon is essentially just destroyed. There's, there's almost no replenishment of it. When you add in, you know, you have a solar metal a distribution and you're spalling those, um, you can replenish the carbon. That gives you the blue, uh, the blue squares wow. there. Orders of magnitude here. Many orders of magnitude. Now what's important to note is it's still really tiny. So you got to think about your, your accreting, maybe a percent carbon or something like that. So you're still going down to, to very low. Uh, yeah. abundances, you're still getting rid of most of the metals, but it's, it's hugely different in terms of metallicity. Mm -hmm. So when you translate from carbon abundance to we look at the total metallicity, you go from thinking that spallation would give you a metallicity of like 10 to the minus 10 or 10 to the minus 14, all the way instead to be more like 10 to the minus five. So it's, that might not sound like a big deal because they all sound like zero or close to zero, but as we'll see in a moment, it does actually make a difference. Which yeah. Is interesting. yeah, I'm sure it does. <clears throat> okay. Uh, okay. So with, with Settle, though, one thing to look at was, okay, how do the ignition conditions change? And that is the figure five. <clears throat> so you're looking at the mass fraction of hydrogen at ignition versus the mass accretion rate. Um, in this case, you're starting out assuming that you're accreting 70% uh, of uh, mass fractions 0.7 for hydrogen. And, um, but then that's going to change at ignition. So for instance, if you don't have any spallation, then you're going to have stable burning in between bursts. Yeah, and so your right. hydrogen is going to slowly get converted to helium. And that's basically the black triangles. Right. So right. You, the slower your accretion rate is, the longer between bursts, the more time for stable burning, your, your hydrogen just gets de depleted. And you see that for the black. Now, when you include the spallation effects, that's when you go to the red and the blue circles or the, sorry, the red, I guess they're red diamonds and blue squares. Uh, and you see that you're, you're replenishing um, the metals. And so you're, um, you're replenishing metals and you're actually also spalling the heavier elements to create hydrogen and helium. So you're kind of just always replenishing that hydrogen as well. And so you never get that hydrogen poor. Um, Right. The difference isn't that big here for replenished versus not replenished. So the, the fact here is just spallation winds up making it so you essentially can almost never have um, pure helium at ignition. You pretty much always have a relatively high hydrogen fraction at ignition, which is interesting. And uh -huh. is this, uh, so you ignite the burst sooner. You, yeah, I believe. Now, one thing we didn't actually look at the... Uh, impact on the recurrence time. Okay. Um, so I think that that's correct, but that would be something for follow-up, um, which we can, we can talk about ideas for that. Um, but yeah, before we do that, we should go, I guess, to figure six, which you're moving to, thank you, um, where now we looked at what's the impact on the burst ashes. So in this case, it was sort of a simple, a simpler approximation. We didn't 
hack the spallation into Mesa, which is something that would be cool, something that I'd like to do at some point. Uh, yeah. And what we did instead is we said, okay, let's just see if this matters at all. Um, we know that we know that if we go from solar to like no metallicity or 10 to the minus three metallicity, we yeah. know that impacts the ashes because Jordi Jose did a, he has a paper from 2010, I believe, in MapJ, where he shows that. The question that we had is, does it make a difference if you go from a metallicity of like 10 to the minus five, which is what we find now for right. the replenish mm -hmm. model, versus something like 10 to the minus 14, which is this, the builds the result to isolate it. So you might think that that might not matter. In fact, when Jaspreet approached me about this, I said, this is not going to matter. But uh, I was wrong. <laughs> so, yeah, <laughs> thankfully he insisted. So, um, so we can see the impact here. So the upper panel in figure six, what you're looking at is the mass fraction after several bursts. Um, and so you're looking in the envelope of the neutron star that basically the, the bursts have occurred and now you just have ashes from the burst. So we're looking at the mass fraction there as a function of mass number. Um, and what you see is the, um, the gray filled histogram. This is if you have solar metals. So you, no spallation going on. That's your, your abundance distribution. Right, yes. Now, then the other curves, the red, the blue, and the black, these are for different metallicities. So the black line is 10 to the minus five. This is, would be our result in this work. The blue is 10 to the minus 14. Um, that is the isolated destruction. And then the red is, that's for fun, let's just say zero. Let's, what, how low is so low you don't care anymore is the question. <laughs> and, exactly. So you can see that when you reduce the metals um, just in general in the top panel, you wind up enhancing the abundances for the higher, the higher um, mass numbers, which it makes sense. It's because you're um, not converting as much hydrogen to helium in the stable burning regime. Mm -hmm. um, so you basically, you have more hydrogen in the burst. And so you can just burn to higher mass numbers. You don't run out of fuel. Yeah. That's what happens. Now yeah. in the top panel, it's a little bit difficult to see the difference between 10 to the minus five, 10 to the minus 14, 10 to the minus, or 10, sorry, zero metals. So that's where you go to the bottom panel. This is the ratio of the mass fraction to the solar uh, mass fraction. So, and, um, what you notice is you have sort of the zigzaggy pattern, especially between say mass number 30 to 60, you have a big zigzaggy pattern. Odd even. And, uh, and it's not just odd even, it's a, there's some odd even there, but it's actually, um, it's A equals four. So helium burning. So, oh, yeah. um, and, uh, but, but it, there's kind of an odd even there as well. And this is where we see sort of the biggest difference. So the black line here now is separated from the red and the blue. Mm -hmm. So the difference between metallicity of 10 to the minus 14 and 10 to the minus five is pretty negligible. So that kind of helps us answer how low is so low we don't care. Mm -hmm. But you do see a difference between 10 to the minus five and 10 to the minus 14. And now the question is, okay, why would you care? And ultimately, um, maybe you don't, <laughs> but you might. You might. The reason the reason you might is that this region, mass number 30 to 60, um, really to 65, this is where you have ERCA nuclei in accreted neutron star crust. So these, this is the mass numbers that host these nuclei that can undergo electron capture beta decay cycling in the crust and create these local heat sinks. And we see that the difference between the original spallation model and the replenished is a factor of two on average for these ERCA nuclei, so the abundances of these ERCA cooling nuclei. And that impact the light curve? It could, it could impact the light curve of neutron star crust cooling. So when you have a neutron star that's been accreting for months or years and accretion turns off, that can impact the light curve. So Alex Dival and I have a paper from 2017 where we show that. Um, now, this factor of two abundance, the question is, does it matter? And what I can say for sure is it's significant compared to changes in reaction rates. So very uncertain reaction rates that we know in, for the burst that we know impact the abundances. And it's also significant relative to large changes in uh, the astrophysical conditions. So the, the mass fraction of hydrogen, the accretion rate, this, this is big relative to those changes. Um, so. Cool. 
So that'll lead us to, um, nice work by the way. Uh, where it is, where do you take this in the future? Where does, where do you, where do you think you'll head with this uh, in the near future? Right, so there's, there's lots of directions to go with it. I think the, the very first order thing that um, is basically already, we're already doing now immediately is um, when we do sensitivity studies to see how X-ray bursts, light curves and ashes depend on changing reaction rates, now we know we need to really take seriously these low metallicity conditions. Um, we hadn't so much focused on the really low metallicity conditions before because the idea was that your companion star is most likely to be a pop two star. It's most likely to have solar-ish metals. Yeah. And so because we have limited time and computing resources, let's focus on those. This suggests, well, hey, if, if you have these collisional, this collisional accretion where you do have, have spallation, then you can have quite low metallicity. So we need to be including these in our sensitivity study. So that's one thing immediately to do. Um, do you think you'll be able to pick any of that up with uh, some of the observations? Yeah, so the question is in terms of observational impact, I think it's hard to say right now. One thing that I'm very curious about is these results and even the Bildson results actually, imply that you cannot have below say something like 0.6 mass fraction of hydrogen um, at ignition and we have bursts that we observe that qualitatively we believe must have a relatively low hydrogen fraction mm -hmm. so lower than that okay and the question is can you consistently reproduce those or not so that would actually give you an idea of whether or not this spallation model actually even happens we we don't really know the details of accretion that well. It could be, it could be that the you lose that 200 MeV 200 MeV per nucleon more steadily, and so by the time you reach the surface of the star, you're not spalling. So this might help answer that question actually in terms of comparing to observations. Um, right. Yeah. So another another thing that we can do that I'm interested in doing is now propagating these ashes through a nuclear um, a nuclear reaction network for the accreted crust and seeing, okay, we now know how we've changed the IRCA nucleide abundances. How does that affect the, the abundances throughout the crust? How does that affect then where your heat sources and heat sinks are, how strong they are, and also the uh, thermal conductivity through the impurity? And then how does that change your crust cooling light curve? So basically just taking this and propagating from the surface you know, towards the core, basically. So that's something that I was already going to do and I've been working on um, for different surface conditions. And this is just going to be another set of astrophysical conditions that we need to use. Cool. Um, yeah. And then one, one sort of final thing we could do in the future is I would love it if there were some enterprising individual <laughs> who was creative enough to maybe put some, you could imagine a hook into Mesa to build in the spallation, right? So you, rather than doing it the way we're doing now, where you piece together these different codes, perhaps mm -hmm. you could um, modify the surface composition uh, with the spallation that we're kind of built in. To that. Mm -hmm. uh, cool. Well, the nice thing is, I think some of the tools you're talking about are open source. Um, so yes. if an <laughs> individual wanted yes. to uh, make a contribution to the open source, you can get in there and put it in and uh, be happy to distribute that. Um, yeah, but yeah, very cool. You consider this a plea for help or a free idea if you're interested <laughs> and you're listening. <laughs> Let's do yes, it. Yes, if anyone's interested, get in touch with <laughs> Right. <laughs> All right, very cool. Uh, Zach, I want to thank you so much for um, sharing your your uh, uh, your insights and your paper uh, and some of the future directions where your research may head head on this. Yeah, thanks for having me, Frank. I appreciate it. Always fun to talk about it. Thank you, everyone. We'll see you on the next one. Bye bye. Okay, bye. Okay, stop share and stop.